In this lecture, I'm going to talk about what we call the regular solution model for um, solutions. I'll get a pen up here. So the last lecture, we talked about the ideal solution. And in the case of the ideal, the enthalpy of mixing was zero. So we were saying that the uh, atoms essentially were not seeing each other. They were not interacting. That's the, the picture we had. In the regular solution, this is the next simplest model. And in this case, we have atomic interactions. Shot again. that are nearest neighbor only. So for example, we've got our lattice and we have, you know, A atoms and B atoms because we're thinking in that fashion. We're only taking into account the nearest neighbor bonding. So we'd have some energy of a BB bond here, the energy of an AA bond, and here the energy of an AB bond, right? And what makes this model nice is a uh, Really two aspects. Uh, one is that, well, it's the simplest model. And when we teach students about bonding, and I think we talked about this in your introduction to materials class, we always had this model of, you know, energy versus separation. And you had some, some well that did this, right? And you had there the energy of bonding, and you've got some R naught, and this is going to infinity, and this is asymptoting to zero as R goes to infinity. And then you also had the shape of the well, which would give you the, the bulk modulus, et cetera. And, and all of this was within the picture of having you know atoms with some ideal spring or force field between them. And you know, even if you start looking at the professional level, uh, a lot of the uh, molecular dynamics models that people work with are pairwise potentials. And this certainly fits within that. So we still have the enthalpy of mixing being the enthalpy of the, you know, system and the enthalpy of the unmixed right remember we had that picture in which we had a box of a atoms and a box of b atoms that give a system of a and b atoms that are then mixed to give a and b mixed so that's the picture we had. And what I'm gonna kind of, I'm gonna jump ahead and then and come back and show you where it comes from. But for now, I want to say that this delta H mix, we're going to find is equal to this is the uh, number of A and B sites. And we can, of course, scale that by the total number of sites. And this is the change in energy or the difference in energy between AB uh, heteropolar bonds and AABB or homopolar bonds, 
right? So this is the energy of an AB bond minus one half of the, uh, well, the average of the uh, EAA EBB. And what we'll see shortly is that this PAB is the number of sites This is the uh, number of bonds per site. Or... or the coordination number, you know, up in here, uh, you know, this would be a one, two, three, four for our little two dimensional, uh, two dimensional crystal times the mole fraction of A and the mole fraction of B. And this substitution uh, will let us write delta H of mixing is equal to omega xA xB. So what's nice about this model, the second part, is that it allows us to write the enthalpy of mixing in terms of the mole fraction and a constant independent of the mole fraction that tells us about the material properties. Right, this is a N O Z X A. I'm sorry, no X A, huh? Uh, N O Z. E A B minus one half E A A plus E B, right? So material property, material property, material property. And oftentimes when we think about equations of interaction, for example, you know, diffusion, the material dependent parts all get lumped together in a constant. And you know, diffusion, you've got fixed first and second law, and that all has to do with geometry and counting the number of ways things can hop. Uh, but the diffusion coefficient, that depends on the particular material you're looking at. And here we have that as well. So what comes out of this is three cases. The first case is when, so worth pointing out here that this is positive, that is positive, this term, those differences in energy are where the uh, different behavior, these different cases are going to originate. So when delta E, A, A, B, B going to, a B is equal to zero, then delta H mixing is equal to zero. And this is the ideal solution. Right, that's what we had before when we say that, well, sure, the atoms are bonding, but they cancel each other out. Uh, therefore, therefore, uh, we only have the effect of entropy in determining the delta G of mixing. Second case, delta E, A, A, B, B, A, B is less than zero. And this gives delta H mix less than zero. And this happens when the AB bonds is 
lower than a so a a and b b bonds right and we know that delta g mix is equal to delta h mix minus t delta s mix so having delta h mix less than zero drives delta g mix to be also less than zero so this encourages mixing And as you probably imagine, the third case is delta H of mixing greater than zero. And when you have that, we are encouraging segregation. because the uh, AA BB bonds are lower energy than AB bonds. And there's lots of reasons for this, right? You can imagine, uh, you know, two atoms that have, you know, very similar behavior like copper and gold. Well, yeah, copper and gold, they have you know, very similar, they have identical valency, they have a very similar size, they substitute onto each other's lattices, they're both FCC materials. You're going to see a good reason for them to bond. In contrast, you can have something like, say, you know, very dissimilar, uh, uh, you know, carbon and germanium right we know that yeah they they do sit on each other's sites in in a diamond cubic structure and we know that there is is a degree of solubility but as you start you know creating a mixture of like you know 50 50 percent mixture of, of carbon and, and germanium uh there's a huge difference in size and bond length and vibrational properties uh, so there you're going to see segregation. Now, to express this graphically, let's just think about the, uh, the, the, the later two cases, case two and three, when, when delta H in mixing is uh, less than zero, we'll have a plot, and this is XB, so that's pure A, that's pure B. You'll have uh, delta H of mixing, which is less than zero. You'll have a uh, Uh, T, or I say minus T delta S of mixing. And we know that delta S of mixing is always positive. So we have this negative sign out front and, and T is also always positive. We're in absolute temperature scale. So that negative sign puts us in, in that. And you add those two together and you get a delta G of mixing. And as you vary the temperature, uh, as you vary the temperature, uh, this uh, entropy curve will move up and down, and corresponding to that will be the Gibbs as well. But everything is always negative. It's also worth pointing out, and we'll talk about this 
in a later lecture that at that point, one, the enthalpy has this shape. It has a finite uh, slope. In contrast, the entropy both on both sides has infinite slope. And that's important. Uh, and as I say, we'll, we'll talk about this uh, uh, later in another, another lecture. But the real important thing here is, is that uh, this means that if you move adding even just a little infinitesimal amount of B atoms in your A, you're going to have a very uh, strong entropy effect trying to incorporate them. And of course, it gets you know, higher as you get down into this you know, one to one mixing regime, but nonetheless, uh, it's an instant turn on in terms of the, uh, uh, the effect of entropy. So let's uh, now discuss the second case where delta H mixed is greater than zero. And uh, this is, well, it's a little more of an exciting situation. Talking about thermodynamics, like it's exciting here. Uh, Delta H of mixing is going to look something like this. Positive. You've got an entropy. Still looks like this. Which results in a free energy that does this. And this is important because right at this point, it goes from being less than zero to greater than zero. So when you're in the regime of uh, this kind of middle area around 50-50 for, well, this particular curve, you're having the system driving toward segregation. But when you're in this region, close to pure A or close to pure B, you have it driving toward mixing. And that's kind of interesting. And it's also interesting is that it has a strong temperature effect, right? Because you can imagine increasing the temperature, right? You increase the temperature, that drives the entropy down or larger because you have the, the the temperature dependence, and that corresponds to driving the delta G mixing into the negative. So at some point, you may have some perfect temperature in which you have just, just touching there. And we'll see that in, in phase diagrams, but this is important because uh, this does exist. What's also important is that as we go to cooler temperatures, to more shallow, oops, to more shallow, go to cooler temperatures, that's going to drive the Gibbs free energy to look like this. And what I want to point out is that you have that point right there. You always have a Gibbs curve, no matter how small the temperature. 
that does this. There's always a little region that is less than zero. And you know, there's a saying that everything is soluble in everything, and, and that's true, even if that solubility may be, you know, one part in a million. But nonetheless, it is. And it's a consequence of the entropy having this infinite slope. And that's what drives it. So you can think then of this type of curve. Well, you can think of these two curves as, as one in which both the entropy and the enthalpy drive mixing. And here, where entropy and enthalpy compete. And in this case, the entropy drives mixing and enthalpy drives unmixing, if you want to call it. So now let's let's go back, and I said we would go back and, and see the origin, see the origin of this uh, omega term, and how we derive this. Uh, thinking about counting. Uh, bonds and the number of ways that we can have homopolar or heteropolar AABB versus AB bonds. And because we're taking the simplest possible model, we're treating the enthalpy as the energy, and, and we'll, we'll show that in a little bit here. But right now, I want you to think about the energy of the bonds. And we know that the total energy of the bonds can be expressed in terms of the, uh, sorry, A, A. This is the total energy. This is the number of A, A bonds. This is the energy of A, A bonds. And then the same for the BB and the AB bonds. So we're basically, you know, taking our uh, box of atoms and occupying it, say A, A, B, B, A, B, B. B, A, and then we're counting the number of A, B bonds and the number of B, oh, the number of B, B bonds and the number of A, A bonds. And if we know the energy of each and we're saying that there's no correlation beyond nearest neighbors, then, then we can work with that and just simply count these bonds. So to do that, uh, we need to define some of the terms we're going to use in this derivation. Uh, Na, that's the number of A atoms in system. Nb is number B atom in system. Then NO, which is just the sum of NA and NB. And then Z, which is the coordination number of 
or the number of bonds per site. So for example, in our, in our uh, picture here, you know, we've got a two-dimensional crystal and in this two-dimensional crystal, each site has with it one, two, three, four possible bonds. Okay, so from that, we can begin just by counting and counting the relationship between the number of bonds and the number of atoms in a crystal. And we can see that the number of A, B bonds plus the number of A, A bonds, oops, A, A bonds times two is equal to the number of A atoms times the number of bonds per atom, it's a number sign. So that's because every time that there's an AB bond, we have one A atom present. And every time we have an AA bond, we have two A atoms present. And you can prove to yourself that this is the case, or maybe not prove it, the proof is in counting, right? But you can demonstrate this to yourself by having, uh, well, let's just make a, a simple uh, 1D crystal. So if you imagine having, uh, say, that and we'll occupy it, uh, oh, gee, the Christmas, A, B, B, A, B, A, B, B, A. So let's, uh, like that. And we'll say that it has periodic boundary conditions. So if this is our system, then this is going to wrap around, whoop, and this is going to wrap around back over here. So we have, you know, another A, B, B. And over here, we've got A, B, B, A, B. So within this box, we have And A is equal to one, two, three, four. And B is equal to one, two, three, four, five. So N O is equal to nine. Z is equal to two because each cell in the box has two possible bonds. So PAA, so we have no, 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 yes. So we've got, a, we've got a bond here between this site and the one on the opposite side. So that's gonna be equal to one, then PAB, is equal to one, two, three, four, five, six. And P, B, B is equal to one, two. So we write out our uh, we write out our written expression here. Uh, that's going to be uh, P 
PAB plus PAA times two is equal to NA uh, times Z. So in this case, uh, substituting in, we have uh, six plus one times two is equal to four times two. So that's gonna be six plus two is equal to eight, four times two is equal to eight. So the expression holds. And if you look at this closely, you'll, you'll see why that two comes about. So, okay, so we've, we've shown ourselves that we have an expression and it looks like, oops, it looks like uh, this. So that means NAZ is equal to PAB plus 2PAA. We can do the same thing for the B atoms and have NBZ is equal to PAB plus 2PBB. And both of these can be rearranged. And in doing so, we can solve for PAA is equal to NAZ over 2 minus PAB over, sorry, well, over 2. And PBB is equal to NBZ over 2 minus PAB over 2. OK. Taking those and substituting them into here and here, we get an expression that looks like E is equal to NAZ over 2 minus PAB over 2 EAA plus N B Z over two minus P A B over two E B B plus P A B E A B. And we can rearrange that and rearranging it, we can get E is equal to one half Z N A E A A plus one half Z N B E B B plus P A B E A B minus one half E A A plus E B B. Okay. Now, what I'd like to make the case for is that these are pure AA and BB. And you can kind of see that because these are just the EAA and EEB terms. And this is delta E of mixing. And, and we can see this, we can see this by saying to ourselves, uh, you know, let me pick another color here. What if P A B equals zero? What if there is no uh, bonding between A and B atoms? Well, for one thing, that would have, look, man, I, I would have that term go to zero. Going up here, that would kill off that term and that term, right? So this, NB, Z over two, that's uh, NB, Z over two. 
same thing in a zero to two. So this is what you have of pure A and B. And this is the delta E of mixing. So this is just the same as what we had when we had our Gibbs free energies of mixing. We would have the Gibbs free energy in which we had put the A constituents and the B constituents in, and then we had some enthalpy of mixing. And that is delta E mix is equal to P A B E A B minus one half E A A plus E B B. Now, our enthalpy is delta U plus P delta V. But we are holding delta V as zero, which means that when we talk about the change in enthalpy, we're actually talking about the change in the internal energy. And because we're limiting ourselves to, to say the only change in the internal energy is the nearest neighbor bonding, then delta E mix is delta U, which means that delta H of mixing is equal to delta E of mixing. OK, good. Now, one kind of interesting and immediate consequence is that if we take this and we set it equal to 0 for the ideal solution, which was in the, the last uh, video lecture, well, if we set that equal to 0, then we set this equal to 0, which gives us E A B is equal to one half E A A plus E B B. So when we talked about the ideal solution originally, we said, oh, you know, it is a good example of when these atoms aren't seeing each other. And in, in the most trivial sense, that's true. And that's, that's kind of the way to think about it, you know, to the zeroth order. But it's not even that. It's, it's when there's no difference between having a homopolar versus heteropolar bonding, right? Because they're equal to each other. So anytime the energy of the AB bond is just the average of AA and BB, then this gives you the ideal solution. So this is kind of a, a, a more accurate and more sophisticated way to think about what an ideal solution represents. But now let's let's move past uh, you know just counting and, and let, let's talk about uh, the probability of site occupancy. OCCU, oh, man, my handwriting's terrible sometimes. Right? So let's say we've got, you know, our two neighboring sites. Site S1 and site S2. So what is the probability the site S1 contains an A atom. Well, that is just the mole fraction of A, right? Because that tells us the fraction of sites that are occupied with A. And in this model, we're not allowing for vacancies. We're not allowing for interstitials. We're not allowing for impurities. We just have a perfect lattice that is completely occupied and has a occupancy of, of XA. Now, you could go back and account for that if you wanted to, but we're not going to do that here. Right now, we're just going to you know, work on the simplest problem, and that is going to be XA. And the probability of site 2 being a B 
Well, that's XB. So if we look at these sites, S1 and S2, the probability of whatever we have here, if we have, say, an AA, and the probability is XA times XA, BA is XB, XA, AB is XA, XB, and they're the same, and then B, B is XB, XB. And for any two neighboring sites, you know, that's all the options we possibly have. And we can prove this to ourselves by taking uh, the sum of these, right? If we take the sum of those, you get XA squared plus two XA XB, right? There's, those are equal, plus XB squared. But this we know is a, a can be contracted as XA plus XB quantity squared. And we know that the mole fraction of A plus the mole fraction of B, it has to add up to one just by definition. So this is all equal to one. So this sum is equal to one. And then that validates that we've listed all the probabilities. So, we ask ourselves how many pair of lattice sites exist? Well, whoop. that is the total number of sites, and we're saying that the total number of sites is equal to the number of A atoms, the number of B atoms. Again, no vacancies, no interstitials. And we multiply that by the number of bonds or the number of nearest neighbors per site. And then all of that, we have to divide by two. And that, that's because if we are counting and say we count this site and we count one, two, three, four, and then we count the neighboring site and we go one, two, three, four, well, we counted that twice. So that one half takes into account that each time that we count, we're counting each uh, bond or each uh, neighbor twice. Okay, so now let's move on and, and talk about the uh, still counting uh, and say the number of pairs of sites times the probability of uh, having an AB site is equal to the total number of pairs of AB or the total number of AB bonds and We've got all of these components now. So we know that this is going to be one half Z N O. We know this is two times X A X B because we can have X B X A or X A X B. And those are two are equal. So we have two of those. And this is P A B. And we can do the same thing and, and get, uh, so this is uh, PAB is equal to uh, one half ZNO uh, 
to x a x b we can get p a a is equal to one half z n o x a squared and p b b is equal to one half z n o x b squared okay substituting substituting into here this we now have delta h of mixing is equal to z n o e a b minus one half e a a plus e b b x a x b and this is omega so this gives us the delta h of mixing is equal to omega x a x b okay so let's go back and I don't think it's in this lecture, no. But if you remember, if you remember uh, when we talked about having two different ways to occupy this lattice, right? We had the A, B, A, B, A, and B versus the a and B A and B in which here we had N A mu A N B sorry little N N B mu B here we had G A N A, and here we had uh, N B G B. In this case, G A and G B were the free energies of pure A and B. And here, this was the chemical potential for a mixture, and this was a large reservoir that was you know, pre-mixed with the right composition, et cetera. Uh, and we're just occupying the system. When you do that, you wind up with mu A, X A plus mu B, X B is equal to the Gibbs free energy. So that's the, uh, the right hand side. And in this case, For the regular solution, you get XA, GA plus XB, GB plus omega, XA, XB plus RT, XA, natural log XA plus XB, natural log XB. This is our entropy. This is our enthalpy. This is pure A and B. This is delta G of mixing. And again, what's something nice about the regular solution is that we're able to use at xA is equal to one minus xB, 
and xb is equal to one minus xa to collect in terms of pure xa or pure xb. So we have mu a is equal to ga plus omega one minus xa squared plus rt natural log xa and mu b is equal to gb plus omega one minus xb squared plus rt natural log xb. And something important is that that is just a material function and it's not related to, it's not related to the composition. right? And not being related to the composition means that it can be moved around. And again, we talked about this, that a lot of the fundamental functions and equations we work with, the material science is hidden in the constants. And, and that's what is the case here. But because we can move it around, it means that we can split things up and, and have an expression for the chemical potential in terms of the material properties and in terms of the composition. So it's also worth pointing out that this entire expression converts back to the ideal solution, right? When this is zero, you get the ideal solution back, which was in the, uh, the last recorded lecture. So that's handy. The question then becomes, what happens when your material constant does depend on the composition? And you can certainly imagine that being the case if you have uh, energies or enthalpies that are correlated beyond just nearest neighbor. So let me, uh, and omega becomes a function of xa, xb. Then we have subregular solutions. So, What does it mean? Well, what it means is that we're no longer able to separate out our chemical potentials in terms of the composition. But the good news is that we still have a means of getting at the chemical potential. And I'll show you how to get that in a graphical fashion. So we know the Gibbs free energy can be expressed as the chemical potential times the fraction of A and the chemical potential of B times the fraction of B. Okay, so writing this out as a differential, dG is equal to mu a, whoops, mu a d x a plus mu b d x b, which means then that our uh, chemical potentials are the change in the Gibbs with a change in mole fraction holding x b constant and the partial of the Gibbs with respect to XB holding XA constant, right? This is just 
just from the calculus we've seen before. But because we have this total differential, that means we can write the total derivatives dg by dxa is equal to mu a plus mu b dxb dxa, right? Because we have, uh, you know, just bringing this to the other side and uh, dividing by, you know, one over dxa, if you will. That's a better way of better way of expressing it. But we also know for that that xa plus xb is equal to one. So d xa is equal to minus dxb or dxa by d xb is equal to minus one, which we can put into there, which means that dg by dxa is equal to mu a minus mu b. Now, if we take this entire expression and multiply by xb, This gives us xb dg by d xa is equal to xb mu a minus xb mu b. Okay, now going back to our original expression that g is equal to mu a x a plus mu b x b we can add those two together and that's going to allow these two to cancel out and that means we now have g plus x b dg by d x a is equal to mu a x a plus x b, right? Because we've got a x a here and an x a b there, but this is equal to one is equal to mu a. Okay, so rearranging that, we have g is equal to minus dg by dxa xb plus mu a. And this is an equation of a line. y equals mx plus b. So if we have g versus xb, and you've got some curve, then at any point on that curve for any composition, you can draw a line. This line has slope m, where m is of course, you know, dg by dxa. And then you have your slope intercepts, mu a and mu b. So this means then that any expression you have, and, and again, we, you know, calculated gives free energies for single component systems and we can do it also for multi-component systems but any gives free energy curve you know 
g is equal to h minus ts at every point you can compute the chemical potentials and they are the slope they are the uh, axis intercepts now it's true and it's something that in in uh, in materials this is at least for me this is how i i, I think uh, but it, it's not particularly convenient and a more convenient way that well for many people a more convenient way to think is in terms of activity and we have activity of you know component a and activity of component b and we define these activities in terms of the chemical potential sorry r t natural log a a mu b is equal to g b plus r t natural log a b now what makes this definition useful here is that, oops, come on. If we're in the ideal mixing, then the activity of A is simply the mole fraction of A, and the activity of B is the mole fraction of B, right? Because this expression is just the expression that we derived in previous lectures. And in the case of the regular solution, else if regular, then we have UA is equal to GA plus omega one minus x a squared plus r t natural log x a hang on i think i might have missed something in the previous lecture uh no that's right squared there squared there uh my memory's playing tricks on me uh r t natural log x a mu b is equal to g b plus omega one minus x b squared plus r t natural log x b and that is going to be equal to g a plus r t natural log a a uh, equal to G A plus R T natural log A B. So taking and combining these two sides of the equation, we get natural log of A A over X A is equal to omega over rt one minus x a squared and the natural log of a b over x b is equal to omega over rt one minus x b squared and this AA over XA and AB over XB
These are defined as the activity coefficients. So in the case of ideal solution, then as a function of XB, here we have a activity of A, sorry, activity of B and activity of A, where we've got pure A, we would have uh, straight lines, and this is one, we'd have straight lines that look like this, right? And we refer to this as the uh, Rolle's Law. Uh, now, in the case of the regular solution though, We have gamma A is equal to A A over X A is equal to X omega over RT one minus X A squared. So this is proportional to X of omega over RT. So this is our uh, well expression above, which we derived in terms of the uh, energies and the number of sites. So that means that if we have A, B, and we have A, B, X, B, one. If we have uh, delta H mixing equal to zero, right, Raoult's law, then we can have a case like this where delta H of mixing is less than zero, which gives us gamma B is less than one, and we have mixing versus something like this, where delta H of mixing is greater than zero, Therefore, gamma B is greater than one, and we have segregation. So these all depend on our uh, you know, expression here, say a proportional. X over omega over RT. Uh, I guess another, perhaps a better way to think of it is in terms of uh, the natural log of AA over XA or a uh, the natural log of gamma A versus uh, A over X A. We'd have something in, so I draw it in like this. So it does something like this. Here, you would say 
a over xa is larger than one. And we say we have high activity. And to say uh, high activity is to say we have segregation. Oops. So that corresponds to sorry, the green. That corresponds. Sorry, wrong color. That corresponds to the green. And down here, where A over XA is less than one, and that point there, equals one, and this is ideal mixing. But down here, we have a low activity. And to say you have low activity, then corresponds to this, in which you have mixing. And this would be the, the language that we use to transition from, uh, you know, speaking in terms of uh, uh, graphical intercepts uh, to something which is a little bit more chemically standard, if you will, uh, activities and activity coefficients. Uh, here, activity coefficients. So this gives us a, a way to talk about mixing of ideal solutions, regular solutions, and now sub-regular solutions. <laughs>